So this idea comes from a paper I wrote this summer, uh, the link to which I will provide at the end. The key is two theses that I want to put forward. One, we need a civic professionalism movement within engineering, and I would argue engineering including design and uh, technology more broadly. And that too, we need learning to not design to be part of that. So let me tell you where this comes from. I have a couple of stories that have inspired my thinking in the past year. The first comes from um, a group of students that I've been advising in the Public Interest Technology Clinic at Olin called Pint. So in their clinic work, um, these students recruit different projects that they'd like to work on, you know, kind of following this model of like, let's do some good with our technical skills. Um, the team that you see here worked with a group that was trying to disrupt sex traffickers. Um, and this group um, came to the students and said, you know what would be really helpful is if we could get a tool that would automate the collection of data from all of the sites where Johns are posting solicitations for the folks that they are trafficking. Um, and then we could analyze that data quickly and send that on to law enforcement and hopefully capture these folks around the country. And the students were like, wow, this is really exciting. We're gonna have major impact with this. They knew how they could build this web scraper. And they started asking questions, you know, that you would commonly expect, you know, around uh, data privacy. How do we make sure that we uh, handle, you know, like this being used in different uh, use cases? But as those questions kind of matured, they started asking deeper ethical questions. You know, and I started helping them out thinking, um, OK, who do I know that's worked on this problem? And I sent out some emails and the replies I got back had some really interesting design principles um, that forced the students to ask questions like, actually is the most important thing um, about what happens to these victims or survivors when they end up in law enforcement hands because we know that there needs to be special training and special handling uh, for the folks that would be swept up in these things it's not just the johns that um, or the traffickers um, that get pulled into this um, you know but it's largely the largely women um, who get swept up in these things and can receive a lot of harm from that process. There could be collateral damage. They reached out to, to professors at Babson and Wellesley um, who had expertise in this, and the students ultimately decided not to build this tool, to tell the folks that they were working with that we think that there is a not, in, um, a not insignificant chance that we're going to do more harm than good. That was a really powerful, really hard thing for them to, to, to decide to do, and it was very inspiring to me. Um, they also celebrated this thing with their students. This is a presentation that they did. Um, uh, for the students saying, wow, this is an important outcome. We learned a lot through doing this. And I think other folks should realize that this is an important way to think about what we do. I wish I had more time in this talk to dive into the second story. Uh, but I'll summarize by saying somehow I had a second experience of students under my advisement last year refused to build something. This time in an Olin and Babson course called Affordable Design and Entrepreneurship, where my team who focuses on mass incarceration decided not to build a platform for a district attorney's office because it didn't align with their values of stakeholder centric design and prison abolitionism. And you can read more about that in the paper. So these examples of design refusal really blew me away. They force us to interrogate our values and assumptions. Engineers usually ask, can we build something? But we also need to ask, should we build something? Yet this cuts against the engineering culture and even our assumptions around project-based learning that we hold so dear at Olin. I'm now doing research with Olin undergrad Shreya Chattery, who was on that pint team on how to define design refusal and how we might teach it. And I think this fits into a larger reckoning going on. We've seen the so-called tech lash in the past few years. We've had workers at Google, Amazon, Microsoft, privileged folks shouting, you know, we should have a say in what we build and we shouldn't be building these things. I didn't go into tech to build surveillance tools or algorithms for armed drones. There are arguments here that more people need to be part of the conversation about what the tech industry should and shouldn't build. And this is where civic professionalism comes in. How can we transform the way we make decisions about what is good for society? How can we move beyond the elitism of professionals? I've been inspired by political theorist Albert Zur, who has studied the ways professionals can democratize their practices, inviting the people they serve, whether they're lawyers, teachers, and I would argue now engineers, inviting them into the process of determining what should we do.
which is the central civic question. I'm also part of a Kettering Foundation network on civic professionalism in higher education that's looking at how we promote this um, in our universities. And I serve as Olin's designee of the Public Interest Technology University Network that is asking the question of how do technologists understand their responsibilities as being to the public interest? Probably most profoundly, the Design Justice Network here is a powerful beacon, and they have offered design principles that center stakeholders and advance a vision for design that is accountable to society and to justice, explicitly engaging with the question of when we should refuse to design something. So we need a movement like design justice, like public interest technology, that organizes us as technical professionals to ask the questions, should we build it and invite our fellow citizens into that decision-making process? We need to understand our professional obligations as civic obligations, first and foremost, to society, to democracy. And I think we should start by helping our students learn when not to design. So I encourage you to check out the paper where I kind of lay this out in a little more detail, and I look forward to the conversation in the breakout rooms. Thanks.